Council to order. Deputy City Clerk, roll call, please. Mayor Schlachter. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Ryden. Yep, here. Council Member Barr. Council Member Driscoll. Here. Council Member Grove. Here. Council Member Milliman. Council Member Valdez. Present. We have quorum. Thank you. I'd just like to acknowledge that Council Member Barr and Milliman have excused absences. So, Mayor? Okay. Yes, sir. I'd like to make a motion. Yes. I'd like to make a motion to change the agenda uh, to add agenda item number two, approval of agenda. I'd like to add agenda item number three, Pledge of Allegiance. Add agenda item number four, comments and reports. Add agenda item number five, public comments. Move the current number to the uh, agenda item, approve city manager contract to agenda item number six and change uh, adjournment to item number seven. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to amend the agenda. Uh, any questions, discussions? If not, let's vote. The vote is five in favor. The motion carries unanimously. Thank you. All right, so next up is the uh, approval of agenda. Any, anyone have any changes to it? Nope. All right, it's approved then. Um, all right, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Next item uh, is reports. Interim city manager, any report? Only one mayor. I'm just uh, very pleased to announce that uh, our officer, David Snook, who was uh, tragically shot in the line of duty last September, uh, has returned to work on a limited duty capacity. He's That's back great. in the building as of uh, yesterday. So we're very happy to see David back as he continues his road to recovery. Great, thank you. City attorney? Nothing from the city attorney, thank you. Okay. Councilmember Driscoll? No report. Councilmember Valdez? None. Councilmember Grove? Oh, I have a couple. Okay. Uh, oh. A couple things uh, I attended this past week. One was the uh, town hall fundraiser on Saturday night where they closed part of Main Street. It was a wonderful event, a lovely evening, um, very well done, and I don't know how much money they raised, but hopefully quite a bit for our town hall. So that was a great event. I also attended a business after hours with the South Metro Chamber, and hopefully this is something that we can see at uh, Littleton when we uh, have an enhanced chamber, whatever, and uh, met a lot of business owners. And it was uh, held at the Meridian Golf Club, and they had a barbecue, and so it was um, informal, and they also had a silent auction too to raise money. So it was a nice event. Tomorrow night, we're having our meet and greet at Stern Park, excuse me, Kittering Park. And that starts at four o'clock and goes till six. And there's meet, greet, and eat. And there's lots of booths there so that you can learn more about organizations around the city. You, you said booths, not booze, correct? Booths. booths. Like a booth where you walk up and you get tchotchkes and stuff like that, that kind of booth. Uh, and then upcoming meetings on Thursday, I want to make sure you have the right date for those people that live around Jackass Hill Park. On June 16th, there is going to be what they call a pop-up feedback event to get more information on what people would like to see in the neighboring area for Jackass Hill Park. That goes from 5.30 to 7.30 and will be a pop-up tent at the southern part of the park. And last, this is something that's pretty far away, but if you want to put something on your calendar on October 1st. Uh, said, uh, council member said, oh, Pro Mayor Pro Tem, excuse me, uh, Ryden and myself will be having another citizen meeting. This one will be at Bemis Library downstairs. It starts at 10 and goes to 9, uh, goes to 11.30. We had so many questions and answers last time. We want to give people a little bit more time. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem. No report, Mayor. All right, just a couple things. Uh, first, I 
people might have seen a bunch of flags uh, lying in the city, because today is Flag Day, which commemorates the adoption of uh, the U.S. flag from 1777. Just want to acknowledge that. Uh, I just want to give a shout out to those who organized the Boards of Commissions Dinner and the Town Hall Arts Gala um, last week. Both were great events. We heard compliments from people that attended those, so thank you to everyone that was a part of that. Uh, I also want to just uh, acknowledge that last Friday evening, I was able to go meet with a bunch of mayors from around the world. Uh, former Mayor Linda Olson of Inglewood uh, gave me a phone call that there were some groups here from the State Department uh, exchange program. And so there was uh, Mayor uh, Ardian Gini of Jakova, Kosovo. There was Olga Dietzi from uh, Juaneng Council, Town Council in Botswana. And she's the only female mayor in all of Botswana. Uh, there is Chiro uh, Buenahuto which is the mayor from Ercolano, Italy. Uh, Bettina Romero was the mayor from Salta, Argentina. And then uh, Chris Papas was from, and I'm gonna butcher this because there was a click in the middle of this word, but it was Mnengi, a local municipality in South Africa. Um, so I just wanna say that was a fun time to get to get, see them. Um, just a reminder council and uh, the public that there's no meeting next week as most of council will be at the Colorado Municipal League Conference. And then after this study session, we will adjourn into, after this special meeting, we will adjourn into a study session. Um, so that's all I have. All right. Next item is public comments. Uh, does anyone wish to make public comments this time? Uh, Pam Chadborn. Hi, Council. My name is Pam Chadborn. I live a block and a half from here. Um, I didn't know this was going to be a meeting opportunity with um, public comment, but I appreciate the change to the agenda, and I'm going to take advantage of it. Um, in the study session, the downtown partnership is a subject. Um, that's a nice, soft, happy name for something that I think is really something else, which is the Downtown Development Authority bid and the ballot measure related to it and uh, the final push to get that on the ballot. So as you know, I live a block now from here in the downtown area and uh, I feel that the Downtown Development Authority uh, process has been hidden from the public, completely non-public, non-transparent, not open to the citizens of Littleton who have a right to understand what the changes to downtown could be from the Downtown Development Authority. This is, the impact is not limited to the people who are affected by the tax, tax changes. And so when I hear, even from the dais, downtown is a gem for the whole city. But then suddenly for the last year, it's, oh, we're going to have a downtown development authority. This is so great. The only people who have to vote are the ones affected by the tax. And that's within a small boundary. Um, these are not consistent messages. And council, you are our elected representatives. So we need you to please represent the city and our interests and help us know what's going to happen and what's the impact on the whole city. And I'm gonna tell you, none of that has ever been presented. <laughs> the most we've heard in public is Patrick Driscoll reporting that, wow, our meeting of the steering committee went really well. Um, this isn't enough. And so what I'm gonna ask is that the ballot consideration be moved two years out. And during that two years, let's have the city for one thing, I want to give the new city manager a chance, a crack at it, to do what the prior city manager really has failed to do, which is bring to the city data and impacts on the city of the decisions that his staff has brought to you to decide on. We need to know, we deserve to know the impacts, and I hope you as our elected representatives will make sure that that's done. And I think with the new city manager, we have an opportunity for that to be done. 
So first of all, let's give the new city manager a chance to help us understand what the impacts are in the whole city and for the whole city to understand what would happen to the historic downtown. Um, and uh, more to say about this, uh, many other considerations, but please council, represent the city in the city's best interests, not five guys who got together in 2017 to influence who's elected to council. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairborn. Is there anyone else that would wish to speak? <coughs> Seeing no one, we'll move on to item six, which is a motion to, or does the city attorney or city manager have a response? No? No response, okay. thank you. We'll move on to motion um, to approve city manager contract. Yep, let me get to that. Try to get to it. And, um, so just for the public, uh, this item is, um, to approve a contract for a new city manager, not a city attorney, I almost said a city attorney. <laughs> um, so as everyone knows, on December 7th, uh, former city manager Mark Ralph announced his intention to retire uh, by June 1st, and that's when he did. And in those six months that we've been gone, going through a, a public search, uh, had almost, uh, almost 80 applicants come in, and we've interviewed the applicants, whittled it down, and um, we're down to one here, and so I think we will, uh, if anyone has any questions for the city attorney about the contract, um, you can ask them. Otherwise, we'll just have a motion and then we can add comments um, to that. Anyone have any questions? Okay, sir. Yes, I'm ready for a motion. Cool. Mr. Mayor, I, I will say that uh, uh, Mr. Becklenburg is here tonight and uh, may be invited down to make comments, assuming. This is approved. If not, we will <laughs> shoo them out the door. <laughs> All right, Councilmember Valdez. Thank you, Mayor. All right, I move to approve the appointment of Jim Becklenburg as the city manager for the city of Littleton. Second. A motion and a second. Any discussion, comments? Anyone have anything to say? Yeah, yeah. I, we, we went through a pretty good process on this. I, it went r rather smoothly. We had some excellent candidates. Um, and uh, I'm excited to have a new city manager. Replacing the old one was a tough job. And I'm sure uh, Mr. Becklenburg is going to do a great job for us. So uh, and I see your families here, and thank you all for being here. That's it. Anyone else have anything to say? Nope. I just want to add that, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to start this new era here in Littleton. That whole process that we've gone through the last six months was uh, uh, an impressive process. We had a lot of uh, high quality applicants and I'm really uh, impressed of the sheer agreement that all the different panels that went on the uh, interviews had for uh, Mr. Becklenburg. And that was almost, I mean, complete unanimous that he was the best candidate that we had. So I think we are, we're, we're excited to get going here. So for that, let's vote. up hang on why is it saying recall there we go it's coming I know so much drama but let the anticipation build The vote is five in favor. The motion carries unanimously. Congratulations, Mr. Becklenburg. Thank you. <clears throat> so, so if Mr. Becklenburg would like to come up and say a few words, I invite him up to the podium here. Yeah, and I will say while it is against our legislative rules for any council member to report on the vote of other council members or their feelings, um, I have spoken with Mr. Barr and Ms. Milliman, and they were both very much in favor of approving this. They just couldn't be here tonight, so. Thank you, Mr. Breitzig, and thank you. Good evening, Mayor, me members of the council. Um, thank you very much for your consideration and approval of my contract. I'm excited to get here. Um, I wanna just first introduce my family, since they're in this too. Um, my wife, Heidi, is just here with, with me tonight. My, my father, John. And my daughter, Avery, is here. We do have one more who's working as a camp counselor this summer. Our son is 19 and 
uh, student at, at CSU, and uh, he, he would have been here too. But, um, you know, I really enjoyed, I want to thank you for the process. I feel like it was thorough. I feel like we all got to know each other. I really appreciate the opportunity to meet with your with talented, good staff I'm, I'm excited to work with and meet with, with citizens um, and just get to know really the some of the flavor of the uh, community and, and the issues that I had done some, some research on. So I'm looking forward to getting here, digging in. Um, tonight, I won't be staying. We're going to go find some, some dinner, but I'll be watching your uh, study session later via video, and I'm eager to, to, to learn more about those issues and really look, looking forward to, to being here, staying through them all, and, uh, and just uh, working with everyone here. So thank you very much. See you in a couple weeks few weeks. Great, thank you, congratulations. I don't know if you're the happiest man in the room or, or uh, Chief Stevens is the happiest man in the room. I don't know, you guys have to battle that out. Right. I feel like when I, I, I walked in, I said I feel like I should bring gifts you know, <laughs> to the Chiefs. So, thank you very much. Thank Congrats. you so much. Enjoy dinner. Congrats. All right, we'll move on to item seven, which is adjournment, and we'll have a five minute break while we reconvene over yonder.
All right, I call the study session of the local city council to order at 6.53. Uh, we got two items on the agenda tonight. First is the downtown partnership update, and then second will be Reynolds Landing River Park Improvements Project update on the master plan presentation. Uh, so I'm going to throw it to Chief, who's going to throw it directly to Kathleen, probably. Um, thank you, Mayor. Kathleen? <laughs> well done. I'm good at this. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Interim City Manager Doug Stevens. Before, I want to interrupt you real quick and just say, you know, at Chief's uh, first uh, regular meeting last week, we went real quick. Let's hope we can get this timing thing on the study session. It's a trend. It's a trend. It's a trend. <laughs> okay. Sorry. So, good evening, Mayor, members of Council, Kathleen Osher, Con Community Services Director. Um, this evening, we're here as part of an update to Council's work plan. Goal number four, of course, being downtown. The first objective of that goal is downtown partnerships. That has been the objective that's facilitated some discussion with both property owners and business operators in downtown and allowed us to also work with uh, Progressive Urban Management Association, PUMA, on a feasibility study of how uh, there may be an opportunity to think about downtown a little bit differently and think about the opportunity to form a downtown development authority or another district type in downtown. So since March of 2021, stakeholders in downtown have been meeting on a monthly basis, um, come together and approach the city about having this conversation about the feasibility of a district. In July, we interviewed two very qualified teams and selected the clear winner, Puma. Um, we're joined by Brad Siegel, far to my left, the president of Puma, and Ryan Anderson, associate vice president of Puma. And then we also have a uh, legal counsel that's helping advise our Puma team, Jeff Erb, with us this evening. Unfortunately, Cheney Bostick, um, who also works on our project, was unable to join us this evening. So I also have Ruth Graham, who's a member of our downtown steering committee, and then Pat Dunahe, who chairs our downtown steering committee with us this evening. Um, Pat will do a little introduction in, in just a few short minutes. So as we begin this process, we wanted to come this evening and share an update about what we've heard through our outreach. We've had a number of conversations, both one-on-one, -on -one, uh, small focus groups, really to try and have a level of understanding from particularly property owners and businesses that are operating in downtown. We developed a study area to begin that conversation so that we could understand where we, they see some opportunities, uh, potentially where there are some challenges and where uh, downtown district could be helpful in solving those. So with that, Kathleen, can I just interrupt? Yes. You quick? So just so council is clear that there's no direction being requested here. This is just an update to provide to council and to the public to about all these discussions that have been had. Yes. Thank you. There is no direction this evening. This is an opportunity for us to share both the combination of the outreach where we see um, logical boundaries for a potential downtown district and then also um, just next steps that, that we kind of see on the horizon. So with that, I'll turn it over to Brad Siegel with Puma to get underway. Great. Thank you, Kathleen, who's on the far right of, of me over here on, on, on the back. Um, I'm Brad, Brad Siegel, and I'm the president of something called Puma. Uh, we'll introduce ourselves formally here in a minute. Uh, next slide, please. My purpose is just to go over the agenda and what we hope to cover over the next 20, 25 minutes. So we want to introduce you to um, not only our team, but also the volunteers that have been rolling up their sleeves and been putting up countless hours on this uh, over the last, well, even before we got on board. So over the past year and a half, uh, we're going to talk about our engagement process. We have um, input from more than 850 uh, Littleton residents and stakeholders about what they would like to see downtown and that uh, visioning from the community is what's really driving uh, our plan for a downtown development authority. So we are proposing a downtown development authority. We'll provide the overview of that tonight. Uh, we'll talk about uh, boundary options for that DDA. We'll talk about what's called a plan of development or what the DDA would actually do. And then we'll talk about what's left in terms of this process over the summer. All of this leads to a potential um, election in November, which would be held within the boundaries of the DDA. So with that, I want to hand it over to our volunteer leader, uh, over to Pat, who's been leading a steering committee 
uh, of downtown stakeholders. Thanks. Uh, let me first say that this started many years ago. Um, Greg and Cal and I have been involved with previous council regarding potential DDA, and I really can't answer why it never ever got legs to go forward other than the interest just wasn't there. Th this is very different. We all, I think, are very unified in our direction, what our hope is here. We've gotten really good feedback from you all, from the community, and our overall spirit on this is um, exactly where I think it should be to go forward. Um, it's also been kind of fun. Um, I'd like to introduce the committee that we've put together, and, and we were thoughtful in this process. It wasn't just let's uh, put some buddies together that we know care about Littleton. We strategically placed this out so that there was a lot of diversity in the skill level of the committee and as well the, the stakeholder commitment to the committee. Everybody here tonight is a ground holder, a uh, stakeholder in the city, and everybody here has business here in the city as well. So I, I take that as a real commitment, and some of them for very many, many years. But, but let me start out with uh, Cal. Um, as many properties in the city of Littleton has been involved as much as anybody has as the past 35 years, and we're happy to have him. And he has like, between he and Kalina, they have like nine or 10 storefronts here. So a, a huge commitment and certainly deserves a voice at the table. Brad Peterson is not here tonight. Uh, he is a local developer on the north side here that we respect the way he develops. We respect him as a person. I don't know why he couldn't make it tonight, but on his behalf, we appreciate his volunteerism. He's stepped in and done a website for us, and we're hoping to see a lot of him in the future. David Law is here tonight <coughs> with Miller Law. He's a lawyer here locally that has a beautiful old historic building that he cares very much about. And um, we like smart guys on our committee, so we have that. Uh, Greg Ranke has the largest property um, in the downtown Littleton area and has done more volunteering than anybody in this room has. And uh, certainly is a respected community leader, and we're certainly glad to have Greg involved. Ruth Graham, sitting next to me, owns Ancient Arts and two other properties here in town and uh, has a bright future with uh, her purpose and what I believe her belief is, and we're just really happy we have Drew. Ruth. Drew Lang, uh, Lang Investment Company, is a financial consultant. We, uh, we need smart guys to keep the money all in check and make sure that we can do this in an appropriate fashion. So we're really fortunate to have him as a committee member as well. John Matthews is a local architect here. <coughs> Um, he also owns uh, a block here on Main Street with a couple of other partners and also has made some s substantial investments into Littleton Boulevard. So we're excited about where that may go and where that reaches to. Um, happy to have a creative urban planner, um, very committed to the historic preservation of uh, Littleton to have John with us tonight. Um, Corey Lundock is here, the second most volunteering person in the group, um, next to Greg. Um, 20 years on the uh, Hoodlum board. And, um, we just love Corey's uh, enthusiasm and relentless energy. And she is calm. Her folks are calm by an ambulance, if you don't know, in their properties. And she also works at Redstone Bank. Um, uh, Lexi C. DeVaca, I'm probably not supposed to be saying it, but we really appreciate you. Um, she's with the Telluray Foundation and has helped us with our vision here and with our hopeful future goals. Uh, I had mentioned Kalina. She has three properties on the entry of Littleton on the west side. Um, 
She's here with us. And dear Jane Barth is here. Um, started Jake's and Kate's, um, both famous places in Littleton. She just had her 10th year anniversary at Jake's Brew Pub. So congratulations on that. That was a fun night after the town hall meeting. And Jane brings a completely different perspective to every meeting, and we really enjoy her um, positions and her character, and happy to have you. Uh, J.D. McCrum is also on our commission and couldn't make it tonight because he has a uh, city <laughs> meeting, I think a city council meeting at Town of Columbine. Uh, and Cindy Hathaway uh, is also on our committee and uh, city has Cindy has the biggest event in the city every year, and uh, she's also uh, involved with us on the Littleton Business Chamber, and she knows how to organize and keep us all happy during Western Welcome Week, and she brings a, a different level to the committee for us to be challenged in regards to entertainment and uh, making sure that Littleton is in a position to host large events. There's big challenges with that. So we go through a lot of that as well. Um, you know, maybe I, just in a shortcut, just an overview for, for all of us from the committee. This is, this is not from Brad um, or from Puma. This is how we as the committee feel, we wanted to bring that up to council tonight, that our real objective here is just, we want Littleton to be welcome and vibrant. We want it to be well cared for. We want to organize our businesses to maximize community benefit and business benefit. We want to encourage outdoor rec recreation and entertainment to the benefit of the entire community. Um, we'd like to orchestrate a real plan of easeability for parking, for walkability, to be bike friendly. Um, we want to accept the challenge of keeping this business district a fun, family, safe place to be. We want to create a real stakeholder board that will honor the history of this city as well face the future of this city. Um, at bottom, what we are hoping for is Old Town to be a prime location for all businesses to succeed and for the community to be proud of. Um, that's truly the heart for where we stand in this. Um, we, we have not dug into the roots of planning. We, we don't want to jump ahead here. We want to make sure that our counselors and you all are on board with our vision and making sure that uh, we do communicate with everybody at whatever level you all see to be best and we welcome the challenges that we have ahead of us which we do have some um, this is not for every voter we've experienced in some of our round tables and some of our direct one-on-one -on -one meetings that some people in this district are opposed to it with fear that it is going to increase property tax, therefore cost them more to operate. And we think that's a little short-sighted in its overall appearance that we, we believe that the economic benefit in the large picture is going to be worth whatever the property tax increase may be. But, but we have individuals out there that are never going to see it exactly the same. So we do have that challenge. Um, we have some boundary challenges and we're listening to our council now as to where those go. Um, we're tuned into that now, I think pretty good with hopefully not a dead end at whatever map that we draw with the hopes that we can expand that in the future and make it beneficial to the whole community. Um, we're, we're not looking to change anything. We're looking to make things better. Ready? We may be done after that. Okay. <laughs> that was great. Thanks, Pat. Yes. Appreciate that. Um, so 
Thank you, and thanks to all the volunteers who have been rolling up their sleeves on this. Um, a lot of folks have really put in some time to what we're going to present to you tonight. So uh, again, we'll try to go through this swiftly. Um, next slide, please. So this is us, Puma. I am uh, Brad, as I mentioned earlier, Brad Siegel, uh, founder, president of Puma. I'm a Denver native. Uh, I always mention in Littleton, I married right. I married a Littleton native. Um, and for the last 35 years, I've been involved in downtown and community development work. I worked in lower downtown Denver back in the late 80s, early 90s. And then our uh, firm has worked nationally over the last 30 years, up and down the front range, across the country, downtown focused work. Um, Ryan Anderson, you'll meet her, uh, her shortly. Uh, she's part of the Puma team. And then we have legal counsel. We've got Jeff Erb. Next, please. So in terms of our role in working with the steering committee, working with the uh, downtown and greater Littleton community, uh, these are the objectives that we had charted out at the beginning. Uh, really understand what's going on downtown and what's next uh, from a market standpoint and also from a stakeholder uh, standpoint. Look at a variety of district mechanisms that could work here. So we looked at business improvement district, downtown development authority, special improvement district. We looked at no district at all. We looked at a variety of different options. Um, and then uh, engage a variety of stakeholders, uh, downtown and Littleton residents, to really get a sense of what do folks want uh, in downtown Littleton. Next, please. Uh, there are three phases in the project. Um, we are probably two-thirds through both phase one and phase two. So understanding the priorities, I think we've gotten a pretty good sense of that. Right now, we're putting together what's called an improvement district plan. And the improvement district plan is essentially a menu, a menu of different activities uh, and public investments that a DDA could take on um, if it is indeed formed. Uh, in a few minutes, Ryan will give you highlights of what is looking to be in that district plan. And then um, our steering committee will be meeting toward the end of the month uh, in two weeks uh, to decide if we should move forward into the legal process to form a district, uh, which we would be back to council likely early August, looking for action from this body to authorize um, a, uh, an election for the DDA to be held within the DDA boundaries in November. Next, please. So I'm going to hand it to Ryan, and she's going to provide you with some highlights from the engagement in this process uh, over the last six months. Hi, I'm Ryan Anderson. I'm the project manager for, for this project here. It's been a lot of fun so far. Great people. Um, so, as mentioned, um, more than 850 stakeholders were engaged with. Um, we did this, uh, we worked with the steering, a couple of steering committee members in particular to create a DDA website. Um, and then we, another big piece was um, an online survey that was, uh, we put it up on the website. Um, the city helped us um, through putting it on their website, email updates, social media. Um, we did a fair amount of one-on-one -on -one intervie interviews and, um, you know, a double, sorry, a dozen roundtable discussions with various groups of downtown stakeholders. <clears throat> so um, for the survey itself, we got almost 800 responses. Um, you know, the majority of people that took the survey lived um, in Littleton, but just not downtown. And then the second biggest group were uh, visitors to downtown. Um, and then there was a, like high equal representation from ages 35 to 64. Uh, a lot more females took the survey. Fairly high income, 77% um, made over 100K. Um, and they were from kind of all over the city. Uh, in terms of how, um, I'm just gonna go over those results with you guys. And um, as far as visitation frequency to downtown, the majority was once a week or one to two times a month. Um, in terms of why people visit, the, um, the top three were special events and festivals, shopping and markets, and um, restaurants and bars, with restaurants and bars being the most popular. Uh, then we asked a question about how downtown has changed um, recently, for better or worse, and um, uh, the most improved was the new restaurants and nightlife offerings. Um, as far as needing improvement, it was the people experiencing homelessness issues associated with that. And then, you know, the thing that hadn't changed very much was parks and open space. 
We also asked um, them to come up with words um, to describe their vision for downtown. And um, these were the most popular words, safe, parking, vibrant, clean, community, and walkable. Um, we ended up asking a question about, you know, the most important programs and services that they think would, could be offered to help downtown in terms of achieving their vision. Um, and this was on a, a scale of um, importance to them. And I mean, everything was listed as generally important to everyone, but um, the top three were support um, small businesses, more events and entertainment options, and to attract new employers and jobs. Um, and then we asked them to pick their most important out of all of them, and they um, the, the tied for first were more events and entertainment options and support and resources for businesses. <clears throat> And then we also asked about physical improvements, um, same thing with the scale um, in terms of level of importance. And the most important was fill vacant storefronts, enhance audience of downtown with second, and then make downtown more pedestrian friendly and accessible. And as far as the most important to the respondents, um, first place was fill vacant storefronts and create additional parking. Uh, we did some slicing and dicing of the data to um, you know, get some details on how specific groups felt and, and how they differed. Uh, there's a lot here, and I'll mention there's a, a really robust summary of all the resu results that you can take a look at if you'd like, um, but these are just some highlights. Um, you know, worth mentioning that the commercial property and business centers downtown would really like to see some additional security, but it's kind of interesting that a lot of the other groups aren't really noticing that as an issue. Um, you know, the, uh, let's see, sorry. <clears throat> downtown residents and visitors really want to see um, additional event and entertainment opportunities. And uh, we also did this for physical improvements um, by interest in downtown. Um, commercial property and business owners were really most invested in um, making it more pedestrian friendly, but all of the groups really cared about that. Um, Additional parking did come up as a major priority, um, but it was, you know, most of mostly of concern to downtown employees and people that were coming to visit, and residents didn't really care about it. And then um, we did the same um, by age. So we took a look at um, program and programs and services, their their biggest interest by age, and um, you know, a couple of interesting things here was. The older you got, the more you cared about managed parking services. And then, um, you know, conversely, the younger you were, the more you cared about additional event and entertainment opportunities. Um, and then physical improvement wise, this was really in line with what we saw with the programs. Um, but again, creating additional parking, the older you got, that's what you wanted. Um, and then, you know, in terms of this is it kind of complements the events and entertainment options, but um, people that were younger really cared about more family-friendly features and events and such. Um, and then everyone really cares about ambiance, um, increasing the ambiance, and then creating um, a more pedestrian-friendly environment. So the results of all this outreach and all the work that's been done here, as Pat mentioned, really for years, uh, led us to the Downtown Development Authority as the preferred mechanism if these are the priorities of the community that we just talked about, what type of mechanism really could uh, be that steward moving forward? So I'm going to talk a little bit about what a downtown development authority is. Uh, to the uh, earlier speaker's um, credit, there's a lot of education involved. These things can be complicated. And I do think that the steering committee, the team, is committed to uh, working with council, other leaders in the community to sort of talk about what a DDA is and what it's not. So it is a quasi-public entity. This is something that uh, City Council will have control over. City Council will appoint board members. Uh, if the DDA ever issues debt, it does require approval of Council. Uh, but it is a champion for downtown. It is that unified voice and champion that currently really doesn't exist in Littleton. So this is, this is a big factor about that DDA focuses on vitality and attractiveness. Um, stakeholders vote on it. 
and we'll talk about the mechanics of the voting. So again, electors within the DDA boundaries would be voting in, in November. District stakeholders sit on the board. So the board is uh, comprised of downtown property owners, business owners, residents, uh, all sit on the board and they make decisions in terms of how the DDA should be operated and what sort of different activities it should be supporting. Um, there are two primary sources of funding for a DDA, tax increment financing and a potential mill levy. Tax increment financing is not an increase in taxes, but it does allow future increases in property and sales taxes. If downtown is prosperous, if there's new investment, and if value and sales are added to the tax rolls, that future increase or increment can be reinvested in downtown. So again, it's not a tax increase, but it's essentially a reallocation of future increased tax resources into downtown. It's a complicated uh, concept. I'm happy to go more into that in the Q&A. Um, Can I ask a quick question? Yeah. The slide deck's long. Um, sure. What are you envisioning in terms of number of board members? Do you have, have you talked about that yet? We have the statute. Legal counsel allows five to 11 That's board right. members. The nod is what I'm looking for. And, and we've talked about 11 board members. We've talked about 11. Okay. Yep. Nine to 11. Um, the other potential revenue source which requires a vote, again, by those who are affected within the district, is a mill levy or an addition to property tax up to five mills. Not all DDAs have a mill levy, uh, but that is an option. The tax increment financing typically will finance public improvements and infrastructure. The mill levy will typically finance uh, marketing, operations, promotions, those kinds of things. And all of this is guided by what's called a plan of development. So the plan of development, which we're going to give you some highlights on tonight. Yes, apologize, there's a long slide deck. The uh, plan of development will show you some of the activities that would be on the menu for the DDA. Next, please. So, well, before you move on, I just yeah. want to make it clear with those funding mechanisms, they don't need to be, they can be set at a later time as well, correct? Correct. Correct. And in fact, the, uh, the way tax increment financing works in a DDA, it does not go into place until the plan of development is actually approved. And again, that plan of development requires council approval as well as the DDA. So um, it, it could be, if this is formed this year, it could start next year, it could start in five years. It's really up to the DDA and the council to make that decision. Yep, thanks. Okay, great. Um, there are about uh, two dozen DDAs in towns and cities uh, throughout the state. We looked at a number of them in the Front Range. So we looked at Castle Rock, Longmont, Fort Collins. Um, Golden is probably a sterling example of what a DDA can do over a 30-year period. Um, and Englewood is the newest one in the state. Englewood formed its DDA uh, just two years ago. Uh, next, please. Uh, we looked at what DDAs do, what type of activities should we anticipate from this. Uh, business support, particularly for small businesses, all of these towns are really anchored by small independent businesses. Marketing, events, uh, plazas, beautification, enhancing different places within a downtown. Public improvements, they can get involved in streetscape, uh, infrastructure, park enhancements. Uh, mobility, which is how folks get around to downtown, so parking management certainly, or maybe some sort of shuttle. One of the things we've talked about as a group is the underutilized parking at ACC and how that could be connected to downtown through this. And then maintenance and safety. These are all types of services that a DDA gets involved in. Next, please. Those different nine DDAs that were on the prior slide, we actually inventoried what have they invested in over the last 5, 10, 20 years. And we came up with these different bundles of investments. So this is good examples of what DDAs do. So the largest bundle is connectivity. It's really uh, uh, trail, street improvements, bike pad improvements, intersection improvements, bridges, uh, development reuse and activation, so filling vacant storefronts, uh, getting involved in housing, uh, in mixed use development. Uh, signage, gateways, public art, streetscape, beautification, marketing, business services. This is all the vast majority of what DDAs are funding and what they've been doing 
uh, up and down the Front Range and across the state. You'll see they also get involved in parks and open space. We were intrigued the parking bubble was a little small, but uh, they do get involved in parking, uh, parking management, or perhaps expanding parking supply, and then utilities. How would that parking management work? You know, we have there's a lot of parks downtown. Would they yeah. be able to have control over? Parking fees, parking hour, how, how does that management, I mean, I'm The sure parking it's management, that's a good question. Um, in a lot of these communities, if there are city-owned assets or parking lots, um, the DDA will um, essentially be contracted by the city to manage those lots, and it may be maintaining them, maybe cleaning them. It may also be uh, looking at how they're used during events, that type of thing. Some of these DDAs uh, acquire land for parking. Mm -hmm. In some instances, and actually it doesn't have to be a big city, um, Glenwood Springs did this, they actually financed bar, uh, bonds for a parking structure. So parking structure is a potential option as well. Um, they organize <coughs> all the different parking that is owned by different people and try to organize it as one system. Uh, so that can help in terms of where employees can park and freeing up space on the street, for example, for customers, if we can find off street for, uh, for employees. So, so like private parking lots um, could work with the DDA to have that lot be managed by them? Correct. There's not a mandate for them to say, hey, the DDA now controls all the parking. Yeah, it's no mandate, but it is, a, it is an option. And, and that's how these work, is usually by contract. So if a private parking lot owner would like to better utilize their parking, uh, they could have the option to contract with the DDA. The, the DDA has none of the powers that some of these other districts have. There's no eminent domain with the DDA. That, that does not occur. There's no finding of blight with a DDA. That does not occur. And there's no regulatory authority with a DDA. All of that stays uh, within the city or, 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 or other appropriate agencies. Great. Good, good questions. Let's keep going. Um, I so, have a quick question. Yes. For Patrick. For Pat Dunham. But uh, South Park was a business district. What was that? Metro district. Metro district. Uh, okay. It functions the same exact way, which it was one of the reasons why the previous mayor had asked me to join this. And the reason why Mark Ralph asked me to steer this committee is that's what we do in South Park. Um, and I, I would hope that you all have seen the benefit of that. Mm -hmm. Um, we're pretty organized. We're a family there in a lot of ways. Um, and it, a, a perfect example of where we're at in South Park is the, the landscape islands, of course, are owned by the city. The irrigation system that's in those islands is owned by the city, but we take care of them. We maintain them. We flower them. We water them. We, we maintenance them, and we're happy to do that. Um, we think we can do a better job at it than you can. That's just cutting to the bottom. Um, and a lot of other open space areas we maintain and take care of because same purpose and same reason. We're willing to take on that responsibility. We, we obviously feel like we have a really nice relationship with the city as well. Uh, so I think this can work out to be exactly the same type of scenario. We have a board, thinking, uh, we have a board of seven people. People just don't know that. But yeah, it's there, and you've done a great job. Yeah, we have we have seven board members. Uh, we're all volunteers, just like the DDA will be all volunteers, and um, we have the most committed people we think in the area there on our board that care about the future of what's what South Park is going to end up being. And we're constantly looking at improvements. We we're involved right now on historical nature. Let's all hope we can be blessed enough on this one to do some really good big things in South Park over the next few years, potentially. Well, I'll, I'll refer to that. The plan later. is to uh, hire a, um, a, uh, a person, um, somebody to manage the DDA, correct? I think there'll be a time to hire a manager. I don't think it's going to be quick right out of the right. shoot. I think that we have volunteers that are very capable of managing. Um, the activities that that right now are on that board. I will add to that I think it's one of the goals here is a professionally managed downtown and um, ultimately it'll be the board that's appointed by this body that runs the DDA uh, to make those kinds of decisions. 
Um, boundary options. Um, we are looking at the core of downtown. Um, it's a pretty, uh, pretty um, compact area. Um, as you enter Prince from um, Santa Fe, and then down so on the south end is ACC. Uh, on the western end is the river and the whole trail complex connecting downtown better to the river. Uh, the railroad track, the transit station, and then of course Littleton Boulevard, which is a gateway uh, into, into downtown. So not going very far up Littleton Boulevard, but there certainly is a gateway influence as well. So on this map, the... On this map, the, 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 is this a proposed boundary? Is the black line or is that just the area that you're looking at in general? This is really a study area. Okay. And it's likely that uh, the proposed DDA area will be smaller. Than okay. This. So what are the white dotted lines? Um, the white dotted lines are parcels that are um, either empty or highly underutilized. So, so that's what's going on on that map. Probably you got Reiki on there. <laughs> okay. Um, another, another. This map also relates to the question on the board of directors. So, um, if and when that board is formed, uh, the DDA we would prescribe the representation from throughout this area. So, if there are four or five zones within planning or sub areas, is a better name the attorney has counseled me. If there are four or five sub areas on this map then we'd want to make sure there's board representation from all those different areas and also different use types um, and, and different ownership types. So with the sub areas, would that be for representation or for having different I mean, actions of, in the plan? Both, actually. Yeah. So the plan and development also speaks to different improvements that could benefit different parts of downtown. Is the city attorney had his hand up? Yeah. And and just, just for purposes of education, can you explain... Uh, to everyone the limitations in terms of where that boundary can extend to. Um, Councilor, you're on. <laughs> yeah, so um, generally speaking... Gotta, get you, gotta yeah. get you your money, Mr. Yeah, your boundaries, <laughs> the boundaries of the, of the DDA need to encompass the central business district and it's somewhat of a... Uh, it, it's definitional based, so it's really the area of the town that's traditionally used as your downtown core where you would have things you'd expect to see in downtown, right? Like business center, lots of restaurants, and a you could almost say it's the place where people say, oh, that's basically downtown. And to kind of double check that use, it would be zoned that way, and that's how it's treated. So um, that's really what it is. So there's some, ultimately the decision is with council on where, you, what parts of the property you think meet the definition of what downtown is. But that's the uh, structure in which you're making the decision. You may be addressing this later, but how do, other than picking somebody from each sub-district, how do other councils select somebody? Do they inter does they have an application process and then selection? Uh, or it's some sort of interview process? Yeah, what we're proposing here, which is what we've um, developed for other um, communities that we've worked in is essentially we're proposing that the DDA would would nominate send nominations to council so for example if a seat is available uh, the DDA board would send three or four nominations typically the nominations are from some sort of application and then council could review from that slate in terms of looking at different qualifications and deciding who they want to select um, so that, that's a that's a process we've employed that's worked well with other DDAs. And does, so does council, have, would they have the option to say you guys can elect the people within there or is it has to be a council appointment, not just a council the, decision? The law says a council appointment okay. and that's, honestly you, you don't want election. No, I know, I just, was just wondering. <laughs> you know. thing. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Is there ever been any problem I could see where it would be like, uh, could be perceived as a preference mm -hmm. that Maybe certain applicants might be filtered out by a DDA um, in terms of the process being as open as possible? Yeah, I, in theory, yes. Um, there, that's why in designing the DDA, we will take some pains in terms of describing uh, the board, the board structure, qualifications for being on the board. Um, I think the bigger issue for many property owners and DDAs is... Um, Council's not 
selecting downtown stakeholders and not selecting people that are qualified. So it sort of goes both sides. And what we have found to be more effective is if we can, again, if we can guarantee that there's some criteria here that is just not willy-nilly, uh, but criteria based on geography, use, um, skill set, variety of things. So they could be a property owner or a business owner or a resident? Correct. Okay. All right, we are around in third and heading home on this presentation. So, um, uh, Ryan, why don't you uh, go through quickly some highlights of what's evolving as the plan of development? Yeah, um, I mean, these are the main categories that all of the um, different projects are organized into. And again, you know, the, the projects really came from the outreach. And these are, these are projects that... Um, there was a lot of consensus around, and then you know we just kind of take that and categorize it and make it um, function well in a nice plan. Um, but improved parking experience was a big one. Um, a lot of interest in just using what's already existing, but doing it better. Um, some of that would be through just better, you know, directional signage and um, that kind of thing. Also, really strong interest in um, dedicated employee parking. And then long term, um, they might want to see a parking structure and understand that it's really expensive, but potentially needed. <clears throat> well connected um, is just really about connecting downtown as well as possible to the surrounding areas. Um, there's a ton of interest in a, a loop circulator, especially from if there are these partnerships with um, uh, parking lots on the periphery to kind of get people to downtown more easily and safely. Um, a lot around, you know, intersection improvements. Um, again, you know, a lot focused on pedestrian um, and bike connectivity, like actually picking um, paths to kind of focus on in terms of that improving that infrastructure. Uh, beautiful and welcoming was another um, category. This is a lot about ambiance. Um, so, you know, more flowers and festival lights and gateways and seating. Uh, it's also a lot about um, activating or creating new public spaces. So, Vega Park has come up and then also interest in creating something new um, on the west side. And then clean and safe um, is another one. And it's just about trying to help everyone feel you know, safe and comfortable downtown. Um, a lot of this is centered around, you know, looking at additional security or additional partnerships with um, police, a lot of um, street cleaning maintenance, and then additional services for uh, people experiencing homelessness. And, um, and then business friendly environment is the last category. And, you know, it's a lot about making um, it easy for developers to get projects done. Um, or for new businesses to start up and then just be supported throughout their life cycle. Um, and a lot about, you know, more events and then more marketing and promotions around everything uh, that downtown has to offer. So, um, drum roll, final slides. What's left in this process? Next, please. Uh, so I mentioned our steering committee will be reconvening again on the 28th. Uh, decision on whether we move into the great beyond and into the legal process to actually uh, move forward with the DDA. Uh, the city is looking at, at a couple ballot issues. Uh, while this is localized, we also want to understand how it fits in relation to citywide ballot issues as well. Uh, we are tentatively scheduled to come back to council. That's when a decision on moving forward with the DDA or not from this body would be sought. And, and essentially a resolution which would uh, form the DDA but authorize a vote. Uh, the vote does require, uh, the, the council can't unilaterally form the DDA. The vote would form it and then it would also have a vote on the different tools which I'll, I'll mention here in a minute. Uh, next slide, which I think is our last one. Before you go to the the voting yeah is it um each property owner for each property gets one plus the business owner so it's double and a multiple somebody owns multiple property gets a vote for every property or how does it work so it's tricky and a uh, counselor up here you may be working here in a minute so it's it's a Tabor vote and so the Tabor vote designates electors within the dda area uh, property owners, uh, if they just own the property outright in their name and they are registered to vote in Colorado, they can vote. 
if a property owner has an LLC or a corporation, they can designate uh, someone who's eligible to vote in Colorado on their behalf, but they, they can designate someone. If you reside, if you're a resident within the area and you're registered to vote, you can vote, counselor. Are you nodding? Am I good? Yeah, you're, you're going right down the list right now. So there's a there's a series of electors that right. is um, it's it's um, it's more complicated than it needs to be. But it's 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 Tabor and it's property owners, businesses, residents, all have some opportunity. How gets one vote to vote? Right. So if you what own is, a property and you have a business in there, is that two votes or it's still, only it's one? Still, ultimately, it's one vote per person. So the way it could work, for example, if you are a resident and you also own a property as an entity, if you entity designates yourself, you're not voting twice. You still only get one. Mm -hmm. so Where you have multiple properties. You can only vote once. Well, you could designate other people to be the representatives of the entity that owns the property. I'm still not clear on the difference between a property owner and a business owner. Do they get one vote? Uh, they would. Well, to me, the difference is a property owner might be the landlord and the business owner might be the tenant. Yeah. That's how I was thinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So context. how does that work? So the tenants would vote as a lessee. So as somebody who owns a, a, a property interest in their lease, they would get to vote. And then the property owner, the landlord, would also be able to designate somebody to vote on their behalf. So that, that would be two votes per property, so to speak. Potentially. You, you could think of it that way, but they really have separate interests. I mean, one person's a tenant and they might be there for one year, three years, five years versus the owner who actually owns the title to the property. Okay. Just curious that they're kind of separate. You get like one vote for each legal entity or individual. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Oh, wait till we roll into uh, the summer on this because the questions just, just balloon. It's a really good question. Uh, all right, next slide, which I think is our last slide. Um, just to give you a preview of what this ballot could look like uh, within the DDA. So again, this is within downtown. It's within whatever our DDA boundary is within that study area. Uh, we know we're going to be voting if we move forward to vote. We'd be voting on two things. Uh, one, forming the DDA. And two, the utilization of TIF, of tax increment financing. Um, a third item we're still uncertain on in terms of whether there's an appetite for it or not, but that's the notion of a mill levy for uh, really supporting operations and marketing and promotions and those types of things. Uh, the fourth one that we're recommending no vote on is bonding because we don't know what projects uh, are going to be priorities. We don't know if, if uh, exactly how those are going to pan out. So the bonding, we're saying, let's defer, let's wait, let's form the DDA, get the authorization for the TIF, may or may not vote on a mill levy. And then a couple of years, three, four, five years down the road, if we have projects that we want to borrow money for, uh, let the district vote on those projects as they occur. And, and importantly, the council also would need to authorize any future bonding. Um, so that would come back to council at some point in the future too. So hopefully that makes some sense and is the next one. Questions? So, so again, thank you. Thank you for your indulgence over the last, it went a little longer than we thought, but um, thank you for that. Council, any questions? I've you got... mentioned the website. Uh, do you have that address? Uh, and what has been posted on that website so far? Yeah, it's um, littletondda.org. I can't remember. Um, and on there is, um, there's a kind of just some general information, like a fact sheet about what a DDA is, um, you know, a way to sign up for, you know, getting updates informationally. Um, there is um, a summary of the, meeting? sorry. Yeah, will this, we post this meeting on this? Yes. Okay, great. Um, the, there will be an FAQ on there as well. Um, and then there's like the, the big summary of all the um, <clears throat> survey results as well. And, and can I just confirm that's littletondda.org. Okay. Perfect. Any other questions? Can you tell us more about how you got the survey responses, that process? Um, yeah, it was an online survey we did through SurveyMonkey. Um, created different links to kind of track, you know, 
what had the most legs or where responses were really coming from. Um, but we put a link on the website. Um, so if anyone went there, there was a, you know, take our survey here. How link. Did they, how was that marketed? Well, yeah, so the, it was on the website, and then their, the city did a lot to help us get it out, like on their social media and their newsletters. Um, Steering committee members um, tirelessly worked to their social media outlets, so we, we got the steering committee to uh, distribute it as well. And any of the other stakeholders we talked to as well. We had a really good list of, I don't know, 60 of them or something that we said, you know, get these out, get this out to your networks, please. So, yes, Cal. How about if it was well, like a um, No, 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 we're not going to. No. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Let me, let me preface what Pat a little off with. Is how, how this sort of came to be. Uh, you know, Mark was, uh, Mark Ralph uh, was Benny Meyer about, you know, saying Littleton, the, 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 the staff, the, the, our, our taxpayers are not going to continue to fund all these events downtown Littleton. We were, we were just running out of money, right? This is all before the PBA. And, and this is several years ago. This is probably four years ago, five, you know, three or four years ago. And he says, we have to create uh, something or, you know, give the owners some um, so, uh, the, the, the responsibility they want to improve their downtown. So that's really how this came about and, and why this committee was put together and why we hired Puma. And like, like Pat said, you know, we didn't have a lot of momentum a couple of years ago, but we have a ton of momentum right now. It's been a very fascinating process for, for me. And, um, I, you know, the, the group of people that are involved in this uh, are, are second to none. You know, I, I think I've been all your ears about, you know, why we're going down this road and why it's so important to, to uh, get this on the ballot. And I really hope uh, we can uh, continue this process and make, make sure it happens. Okay. Yeah, I, I want to piggyback that. You, you stole the thunder on that. Yeah, it, mine too. <laughs> <laughs> it really does go back, back to Mark Ralph and staff that, that came in. Uh, gosh, this has been a three, four year thing in the making. And uh, the councils that we've had in the past were uh, got a lot of information. It was an education thing on this learning curve. And I think some of our council members now have a learning curve on this. But this has been in the making for years. And we're finally getting to a point that, that it's like, it may be happening. It may be happening. So uh, thanks for hanging in there. Uh, to, to the business folks, I know it's been a long time coming. Well, and the, the historical view of what's happened down here is that um, you know, 25 years ago, the, the, we had hoodlum. And, uh, and when, I, uh, when I showed up 25 years ago down, down here and I learned what, that there was a merchants association I began attending, we had 12 members. And what we were doing at the time was charging, um, I think it was $20 for membership. And, um, and then we were trying to do these things that are being listed improving the area, having events, beautification of certain things. And so we really had th three avenues. We had volunteers. And, the, and uh, we had uh, the, the very little funds, can you imagine, you know? And then, and then we would, you know, the city would, city tax dollars to do some of these improvements. We've said for many years, uh, decades, that if we had some sort of, uh, uh, of an organization that had some teeth, uh, an ability to, to generate some funds, that we could take on so many projects in downtown Littleton. And 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 the events that have come down come the, the things happen down downtown Delta right now are shocking to me that we've done so li we've done so many things with such little money for so long. I'm quoting Greg Greikey now that we can do anything with nothing, and so that that only has a short sh shelf life because we really can't do anything with nothing. We have to have some sort of ability to fund uh, what's happening down here and really. The other thing that's happened is that um, the buildings down here, the historic nature of it, a lot of those things have really been a hard fought battle by many of us who own buildings down here, who wanted to put in a historic district, who wanted just to have some regulations around what we could develop, what could be developed and what could be changed about our buildings. And the reality, the people who own the buildings down here, we put so much into it that we want our properties to to reflect the history of Littleton. We want them to reflect the value that we personally have 
have sacrificed for my, for many of us to um, to keep them the way that they are and to make them and to and to keep them keep them and improve them. So having something like a DDA would be a um, a grassroots, it really has been a grassroots effort to put this together, and we are very interested and concerned about the what what happens with our businesses. For, the, for, for those of us, some of us run businesses down here and have tenants down here. We care a lot what happens for them. We care about the residents in the area. Some of us are residents. I, I personally walk to work a lot of times. Janie, I, Janie I know walks to work because we, we live down here. We don't just... Um, we don't just have businesses or property down here. We are very involved in the area, and then um, and so so those are the things we care about. We care we we care what the whole city um, how they want to utilize our downtown area, but we also feel like what is a, what is proper in, to do is to allow stakeholders to really make a lot of those decisions. We've been. Uh, I think we've, we've shown that we've been good stewards of the downtown area. And I think that uh, going forward, that would be the kind of focus we'd have about how to continue to improve and, and keep this, this gym that we have. Those of us that own down here, we own because we love it. It's, it's, it's in our blood. And that's, so, so a DDA really can, uh, can meet a lot of, of uh, the needs and take some of the tax burden off the city to do the improvements in downtown Littleton. And, and, and many improvements haven't been able to be done because there hasn't been any funding for it. Yeah, I have one final question. Uh, what are the uh, implications, ramifications for including public property, um, city-owned property, or, or you know, ACC or county building or whatever into the DDA? Well, maybe you're getting to, these in, to the extent they're tax exempt. If that's what you're getting at, nothing. But, well, t tax voting, um, you know, yeah. anything. Um, they're tax exempt, so even if there is a TIF in place, uh, it wouldn't matter if they don't pay property taxes. If there's an operating mill levy, it wouldn't matter. And then, as far as voting, it the, it needs to be. Um, the governments don't have a vote, so um, any city-owned property wouldn't generate a vote by a city person. Quick questions. Um, is this will pass by a simple majority, like fifty-one percent, is enough to make it pass? Correct. And then it's an all-inclusive district. You cannot opt out. Correct. I mean, the way you're designing it. You, correct. Uh, and you, if you're adjacent and you want to annex in later, you can annex in later. Could someone, if they were adjacent to the proposed boundary before, could they petition council? At the, you know in the next two months and say, hey, we want to be added in. I mean, hopefully they would be part of that process and wouldn't, would you know. Yeah, it could be that simple with contacting the group, I think, and saying we want our property included. I think the caveat is still meeting the definition okay. with the central business district. But, you know, things might change over time, too, as the city changes, right, what's the central business area might expand and ultimately be bigger than the initial boundaries. Yeah. And that's how you would include properties. Yeah. Well, question. Oh. Is that the same for nonprofits? Yeah, they're not going to. I think I know the answer to that, but I'm going to double check that. But <laughs> I don't think that they'll be voting either. But we, should, I'll, I can double check that. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to piggyback off what uh, Councilmember Driscoll said that you know the whole reason that we're you know this is for the public watching and everyone else that we're having this conversation is that you know Council identified downtown as one of our our major goals, and um, you know it's either. The city continuing to invest in downtown, you know, put money into it, having no one do that, or having an organization do that, and this is one of the options, um, and that's why we're being talking about a DDA here. So it's kind of a kind of a three pronged choice here: is city nothing or some formal organization. So thank you so much for the presentation, and we look forward to <coughs> chatting again next month. Yeah, just one last comment for the group. I suppose. <laughs> I'll allow it. <laughs> uh, in reference to earlier discussion that uh, was had about uh, acknowledgement and being open in regards to this DDA, we 
we plan on having many public meetings. We plan on having individual type meetings with businesses. There's going to be a huge outreach to make sure that everybody understands what, what this is going to be and what it's going to look like. And that's what we really are here for. Brad and his folks won't be able to do that exclusively. Um, we're going to have to put boots on the ground to do this. We're probably going to need 20, 25 people to do what we're going to do in terms of outreach once you guys have given us the go ahead on this. Thanks. Right now we just been fact finding. A Great. lot of fact finding. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, we got to change into the guard for the next item, but we just take a quick uh, break and we'll reconvene with the next team this year at 8 o'clock. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
uh, back for the next item, which is a Reynolds Landing River Park Improvements Project update. Just want to make note that Mayor Pro Tem Ryden uh, left the meeting. She wasn't feeling well, so just the four of us now, and you have a board. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to the interim city manager, who will quickly toss it over to the public works director. Thank you, Mayor. Keith? Good morning. Oh, sorry. Um, Are you got paid by the word? <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, that's not what I wanted, so give me one second here. Right, back to Chief. I know. Back to the Chief. <laughs> Phil. We got Phil. So, hold on. Let me go back to the ask Keith if he was ready to start before I just threw him. I know. We were ready, but I, I decided one of the pieces that's in your packet, um, I uh, wanted to have in the You're stalling. No, I'm not stalling. <laughs> we'll get there. We're losing our, our TV audience. Man. I know, it's crazy, so we'll get there. Um, yeah, we just wanted to, oh, I'll get started and I'll figure this out. I introduce everybody. That's probably the easiest thing to do. Um, since things are getting a little crazy here, all of a sudden, technology-wise. Well, first of all, I'd like to take a minute and introduce. So tonight, what we're going to do is we visited with you um, in the last year to talk about Reynolds Landing and um, where we're going with this and the project and all those kind of things. And the last time we visited with you, that discussion was really about, here's some concept designs, but let's talk a little bit about um, our objectives for um, taking down what we want to do with the structures on the Sperchi House. And you gave us direction on that, which allowed us to move forward from a design perspective. So with me tonight, um, Dave Sadugis is here from the Mile High Flood District. Um, he's the uh, Construction and Maintenance Director with Mile High. Bill Newman, the president and managing principal of DHM Design. Um, and Bill's done work with us here in the city before. And I found a story out about his history in a particular piece of stuff in our city that I didn't know about that he did when he was in school um, a couple weeks ago. And then Mag Deal uh, Garcia uh, from us, uh, they're from Mer he's from Merrick. <coughs> he's handling the civil and water design. They're our primary consultant. Um, to, to be part of our presentation today. So what, what we want to talk to you about tonight is um, uh, this is sort of this is a final concept design to show you where we're going from a project perspective and to share with you what that looks like, what the financial package around that looks like at this point and what the phasing could potentially be um, as we proceed. Um, and we're going to go through that tonight and at the end of this what we're going to be looking for is some feedback on um, the concept design and then also a little bit of sense of where you are in terms of understanding the financial picture and how we go forward with the phasing from that perspective. Direction. Mm -hmm. looking for direction? Yeah. yeah, just general support. You don't want us to you know, change. No, you're not moving stuff around. No. It's, 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 There's no it's, Legos it's, to move around. It's a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Yeah, pretty easy. much. Okay. Um, as a side note, this same presentation was given to um, the South Suburban Board last week. Um, at their regular board meeting, um, and they supported with concurrence the design at this point in time. So that's what we're going to jump into. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Dave, but I'm also going to try and get the presentation up at the same time. So, so Dave has to fill in. I know, it's hard. It's hard. Okay, fill in. Okay, great. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, again, I'm Dave Scudis from the, the My Life Flood District. Uh, Council Member Valdez, a former member, and Mayor Selector, a current member. Glad to, glad to see you both. Uh, I, I read a, a study recently about happiness, and it was kind of interesting. It was talked a little bit about uh, who you might be with to be happy and what the weather might be. But when it came to where, people tend to be happier if they're out in nature, a little, little happier still if they're near water, and then even happier still if it's someplace beautiful. And, and this project really has the opportunity to provide all three of those things really in the heart of the city, along the only river in the Denver metro area. And so council chambers weren't the top of the list of happiness? Uh, it didn't didn't <laughs> no, fit okay. on the study. Yeah, I didn't I didn't see that on there. I didn't scroll through every bit of their data, but uh, we'll wait for the PowerPoint because next I'm gonna show you a map, which uh, <laughs> I probably could skip because you probably all know where it is, but basically the site is next to the Breckenridge Brewery on the east side of the river. 
uh, near Designs by Sundown. Uh, is this clicker going to work with PDF? I don't think so, but we'll proceed. Let me try. You guys can battle it out. Can we use a mouse? There you go. It did. It did work. It's only 700 slides, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the mission that we've laid out for this project is to create a place to gather, play, and explore the waters of the South Platte River, and that is the site on the, the right side of the river there, and you can see the Breckenridge Brewery off to the right in, in the, with the red buildings. Uh, just to orient you a little closer, we've got the Columbine Golf Course to the, to the north and west, South Platte Park to the south, and we're just on the west side of Highway 85. I'm not sure if that's going to work. Uh, as you get in closer, you can see we're, we're really directly adjacent to the Breckenridge Brewery, uh, Meadowood Village, uh, and Designs by Sundown, like I, I mentioned earlier. We laid out four primary goals for the project. One is to connect people to water. Uh, the second one is to restore habitat and improve river health. Uh, number three, reduce conflicts on the trail. You got people going different paces. That creates all sorts of opportunities for injuries and conflict, and to improve the trails in general, uh, Mary Carter Greenway Trail is a regional amenity. It's one of the busiest trails in the city. Uh, goal number four is to create diverse recreation in this really special place. Uh, so this is a project organizational structure, the entities that are involved officially to date. You can see the ownership team there. Uh, the Colorado Water Conservation Board actually owns the river corridor in this area, so that's why they're one of the stakeholders. Uh, and then the Mile High Flood District, uh, as to date, we are managing the design and construction and, and, the, and all the funds are being funneled through us uh, at this point in the game uh, because the primary driver of the work is the in-river work. We've also attracted a fair number of outside funders, uh, not all officially on board yet, but we've got a lot of promising interest uh, from people like the Great Outdoors Colorado and other nonprofits. Uh, you can see the design team there. And then we also have a contractor called Naranjo Civil Constructors that's already on, on the team. Uh, at the district, we use a project delivery method called Project Partners. And, and what it does is it lets us bring a contractor in during design and work with them on things like phasing, risk, value engineering, early costing, all these things that help us give, give us better certainty and predictability in everything we're going to do on this project. Uh, and if you're familiar with the River Run project uh, downstream of Oxford, where the standing surf wave is, uh, Naranjo built that project. Uh, for anybody that may be not familiar with the Mile High Flood District, I'll very briefly describe who we are. We're a special district that encompasses the greater metro Denver area. Our funding comes from a mill levy on property taxes. And in very basic terms, we help facilitate the rhyme and reason to how 3,500 miles of major drainage ways are managed as they cross city and county boundaries. Uh, some of our services include uh, flood warning systems, uh, land development review, engineering criteria, master planning, floodplain mapping, maintenance of our waterways, uh, and then capital construction, which this project would fall under. And this slide shows just a, a smattering of examples of some of the projects we get to build. And when we can really achieve the highest value in a space, it means we've protected people from flood risk and at the same time created a space that makes the community healthier and more beautiful at the same time. And we're really hoping to bring similar magic to the Reynolds Landing site. So I'm going to turn it over to Bill to talk about the master plan. Great. Thanks, Dave. What are you pushing here? That one. <laughs> oh, you got it. There you go. Just that point it at me, and I'll, I'll just point it at you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You make the sound loud enough. <laughs> no, that sounds good. So this is the uh, current uh, master plan for Reynolds Landing. This was last updated in 2015. So this shows kind of the existing facilities that are there now. It shows the expanded parking, that trailhead parking that was done, the additional picnic shelters. Uh, the trail connection that uh, created the roundabout uh, opposite designs by sundown and kind of creates that connection behind the Breckenridge Brewery. And then uh, if you look kind of in the center, there's an uh, un uncolored area. That's the city of Littleton's property that was known as the Saperci property. Um, so that's kind of where, where we last left off. Go ahead and flip that, please, Keith. So Put the clicker at me. It'll work out. <laughs> So over the last uh, few years, we've had a pretty robust public outreach. Uh, we've had several uh, on-site uh, pop-up events where we've shared uh, concepts and ideas with the public. 
uh, we've met with specific user groups uh, along that use the, the site, use the river. Uh, we've had a pretty uh, uh, good uh, interactive website that we've put up. We've put some banners up on the site, uh, inviting people to go to that website. And then we've also had pretty uh, uh, extensive involvement with the South Platte Working Group, which, which the city is, is part of. Uh, we see it's received some pretty good positive feedback from the uh, for the project. Some of the items that we heard, comments that came back, were a desire to uh, connect to nature, especially the water. Uh, people wanted to see improved river access and health, uh, expansion and kind of the passive activities of the site. People wanted to see additional trees for shade. And then the other comment that we had from people was a desire to reduce conflicts between the faster moving bicycle traffic versus the pedestrians. Next slide, please. So this is an updated <coughs> graphic of the proposed uh, concept plan that we've developed. And what this does is shows kind of a wider expanded river terrace. It shows a, a, a modifications to the existing uh, greenway trails, the Barry Carter Greenway, and I'll talk a little bit about the detail of that. It shows a uh, much more expanded uh, program for the upland areas with uh, exploratory uh, pathways and shelters and overlooks. Uh, we've uh, also um, provided or, or shown on this plan uh, expanded trailhead parking, and that we'll talk about the phasing. There's a space for a possible restroom concession building and a possible future ranger maintenance uh, facility. So this is kind of a uh, big picture looking at at uh, the proposed plan and, and obviously we're improving the river as well. Next like slide, more. please. So the... Uh, it looks like there's more um, habitat as well. Kind of. Absolutely, that's one of the goals. So that plan, the, the plan addresses the four goals that Dave discussed earlier. So in, enhanced uh, river health, habitat, access, uh, this shows kind of the trail improvements we're proposing. Uh, to address the concern of, of the two different trail user groups, we've pulled the paved Mary Carter Greenway closer to the parking and separated it from the pedestrian. So the red line represents the concrete Mary Carter Greenway trail. The yellow line represents the soft surface crusher vines trail. Both are the Mary Carter uh, Greenway. And that allows for that river user group and pedestrians to be up along the river and not have that conflict with uh, bicycles. Uh, there will be a, a second or a third trail that kind of follows the river bank and it, um, from the put in to the takeout, uh, river users are able to kind of walk along the banks of the river and uh, it's kind of creates a, f a family floating circuit there. And then the fourth type of trail, we've got some meandering nature trails that run, extend through the uplands, so allow people to explore. We've expanded the Cottonwood Gallery uh, through there. One thing about the red trail, we've created a pedestrian bridge, which I'll show you some details. We've got a bridge that runs through the site and the, and the, for the bicycles uh, shown here, and the pedestrians would actually go underneath the bridge. So we're, we're trying to separate that conflict uh, between the two user groups, and it also creates a beautiful gateway into the park. So this would be a view kind of from the parking lot looking uh, west into the park. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the existing Sir Perchie property. Uh, when we met last, we talked a little bit. Uh, we would remove the house and the two barns on the site, and then we would restore the, the, la the native landscape here. Uh, by Destroying the Saperci property starts to create a continuous 30-acre open space park from one end to the other, including the river. So it really has a you know a, a great impact by uh, starting to incorporate the Saperci property into the park. Some of the upland activities that you know we would include. One question. Sure. So the the property that we had discussed a while back, Keith, that was available. What is happening there? That's if to reference it for everybody in this picture, there's Breckenridge Brewery to the east. You can see in the upper left corner to the, just to the kind of left of that. Actually, I'm looking at that screen and I feel like I'm doing one of those verify things like 
because um, it's broken up, like pick the tractor or something. Um, so the left, the left halfway down is the property we're talking about that we had discussions about. Since that time, it's still in the, um, the owner's hands, um, the Guggenheim Foundation and a Guggenheim Trust, and they've done um, under their stormwater permit, they've moved a lot of dirt um, out there to get it to um, as developable as possible with as much out of the floodplain as, as they could do, and it's still in that state today. That's the property between Meadowwood and yeah, the parking lot. Between Meadowwood and the, par the existing parking. So your design is leaving that out? Correct, Correct at this point, yes. Sir. Thank you. So some of the upland activities, you know, would include uh, nature play and obviously the, the biking and, and jogging, walking. Uh, there would be places for fitness classes, uh, picnicking and bird watching. So very, you know, passive type activities that you can kind of see there. We've created some uh, turf areas for people to sit and, you know, play and some uh, viewing areas. Uh, good connections down into the river. Magdia will talk about the river in a second. The sunbathing's in there for you, Jerry. Oh, nice. Yeah. So nice. We make sure that was in there. <laughs> so some of the upland uh, amenities, you know, we would provide spaces for outdoor gathering. Uh, there would be nature nodes, paths for exploration. And we want to include some interpretive uh, displays. And one of those displays might talk a little bit about the Superchis, uh, kind of the uh, what happened on that uh, site over time. Uh, we would include a large picnic shelter, uh, kind of a grassy knoll. You know, there would be additional benches along the trails. Uh, we want to provide much more tree canopy for shade and, and habitat. Uh, there are opportunities for uh, kind of river sculpture and play areas. And then at the bottom of the screen, you kind of see we, we're providing, uh, showing where the space would be for future expanded parking we want to make sure all the pieces kind of fit together before we move the, the trail to make sure it, you know, it phases nicely. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Meg Dale. He's going to talk a little bit about yeah, the, the sure. river. You see, you get the too. see if you got the magic touch. <laughs> Let's see. Yep, there you go. It's working. I don't know what button you're pushing. So, um, <laughs> no. You turn it off and then turn it back on. He was blocking my signal. <laughs> so, so before I go through, um, kind of we go through the river improvements, I, I'd like to uh, give to you a quick background information about the river, just to kind of understand some of the things that uh, we're dealing with. Um, this is a photo of the section of the Safra River at Reynolds Landing Park. And uh, this photo essentially illustrates the existing condition of the river as well as kind of some of the issues that this project, our project is, is kind of trying to fix. So um, first of all, it, it is important to know that this river is essentially a flood control facility, which was designed by the US Army Corps of Engineers in the 80s with the main purpose of being a flood control channel. So as you can see in the photo, the river is essentially a, the river cross section is essentially a trapezoid, three to one side slopes, flat bottom, Turns out good for flood conveyance, but not so good with vegetation, not so good with access and channel stability. As you can see, the river is very degraded and um, essentially lacks some of the elements of a healthy river system. Within this section of the river, uh, we have uh, these three large, quite uh, drop structures. Uh, you can see one here at the bottom, the other one in the middle, and the other one kind of like upstream. Uh, this one in particular is the one located uh, at the upstream section of, of our project. And uh, these things are, are essentially unsafe for, for river users. In fact, there have been some instances reported of people getting trapped at these locations because of the dangerous hydraulic conditions that get form at these locations at you know, certain flows. Uh, on top of that, they don't promote any vegetation. They don't uh, promote any habitat. So, uh, and, and they are essentially barriers for fish. So our project is looking to remove them. Um, one of the things that I like to kind of highlight in this photo here is this area kind of upstream where you see that, that terrace in kind of bending into the bank. That is uh, the end of the river restoration work that was completed a number of years ago by ERC, who is the, the geomorphologist who is also part of our team. And uh, so one of our goals, one of the goals for our project is to um, extend that terracing 
and kind of connecting that with our project, essentially continuing that restoration through our project reach. So uh, along those lines, uh, uh, the river improvements are essentially a restoration approach. Uh, we want to rehabilitate the river, kind of bring back the natural, ecological, and beneficial functions of a healthy river system. We want to add some recreational elements to it. Uh, we want to improve safety. We want to um, enhance habitat and fish passage, but at the same time maintaining the flood control characteristics of the river, of the property, which is kind of the, the original design intent. And that's um, where Dave comes in. Excuse me? That's where Dave comes in. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so um, this is a side-by-side -side comparison mm -hmm. photo of two areas within the South Platte River. I'm going to stand here. Uh, the area here to the left, <coughs> or to the left, is Reynolds Landing Park. <clears throat> photo to the right is River Run Park, a project that we completed um, four years ago. Uh, and it's located three, four miles downstream of Reynolds Landing. So um, this photo kind of shows the intent of what we want to do in the river. We want to essentially take these three exposed rock, kind of large drop structures, remove them, and take that hydraulic drop and spread that along our river reach in a more gentle way, kind of creating more of a drop and pull kind of configuration that can support fish passage and can add some of that recreational value that, that we're looking for. Uh, we also want to narrow the river channel, the main active, I guess, uh, river channel, create more of a compound cross-section that can uh, function in a more balanced way with the current flow regime. And at the same time, we want to add, you know, these, these wetland and riparian terraces um, that kind of add this kind of meandered look to the river and also uh, will help kind of develop in that vegetation that will support uh, wildlife. As far as the recreation, we want to create some of these uh, cobble bars, and some spaces, some opportunities for kids and families to come and connect with the water where, you know, spaces where kids can dip their toes in the water and explore along the shoreline. And for the more advanced users, we want to create um, some of these white water elements and opportunities for them to do some tubing, some river surfing, some kayaking, some puddle boarding. And, and one of the goals of our project is to kind of take some of the pressure off from South Platte Park in terms of the, the in-river user, the traffic of in-river users. <clears throat> and we think that by creating some of these amenities, will be able to alleviate some of, some of that pressure. So wh where you see that kind of open rapid over there, kind of where it says the river, it's kind of where the first, that big drop structure that I was showing to you is, and the terracing is further upstream, so we're kind of connecting all that and continuing that terracing through it, through our project. Um, this is kind of like a photo of River Run that kind of shows the overall objective of our project, which is essentially connecting people to, to water want to create an access to the river and, and essentially diverse recreation. As you can see, some, some kids and families enjoying along the shoreline, some people kind of sitting along the bank, and for the more advanced users, some, some white water uh, recreation. Um, another design element within this project is this opportunity of creating these extended flood areas, uh, which means essentially that we are connecting the river floodplain to this open space area that we have available that is just south of the Superchip property. And uh, the other element is this, this uh, storm apple, that it's, a, it's actually a, it's a future city of Littleton storm apple that is intended to go under Santa Fe, continue through Breckenridge property. In fact, there is already an easement um, acquired for that. And uh, as opposed to kind of extending this, this piping into the river, we think that there is this amazing opportunity of transforming this open space area by creating a low flow channel that will meander around some of these existing trees before it connects and discharges into the river. And by doing that, we think that we are not only creating another space, another um, habitat for the community to enjoy it and connect with it, but also uh, we're providing an opportunity to develop some wetland ecosystem that can filter that water carried by this culvert before it reaches the river. How much water would you expect that to, to move? I, I mean, think throughout the year. Yeah, I, I think... And I'm thinking water for the vegetation. Well, uh, so so the culvert will definitely carry some water, mm -hmm. but um, I'll, I'll get here to the next slide to, to one of the, Thank you. the elements. Um, this is kind of the extent of the culvert. As you can see, it kind of extends underneath Santa Fe, continues through Breckenridge property, and uh, it will essentially discharge in this open space area. And uh, kind of the main objective of that, of that piping, of that culvert, is to kind of 
you know, um, divert some of the range view tributary flood flows and, and kind of mitigate some of these flood inundation zone that is shown here in blue. So that's a pipe? So, yeah, the concept is, is that it, so you, to, it, the blue pipe would become there. That's the kind of stuff that just never was built because of the railroad over time. And so this alleviates a portion of that flooding that's potentially there for Meadowbrook. And so this, it would be a pipe under Santa Fe and there's an existing easement that runs through the property that Breckenridge holds. And then we would daylight it once it gets past Breckenridge so that we can use it as a habitat restoration option in that area. So it's underground until it gets to Breckenridge. Correct. So um, I think the, the maximum capacity for that culvert, I mean, I think it's based on conceptual design is still was like a 700 CFS. So that is still kind of conceptually, you know, it needs to go through, through design. Um, it can move a lot of water when it has to, but it's, you know, that's very, it's stormwater, so it's, it's dependent upon, you know, but it'll, it's an opportunity for us to create some more habitat that just doesn't exist today. Well, well, my thought is if we put in trees or something mm -hmm. and it gets water, then all of a sudden it's dry again. Well, that's part of, part of the discussion here is yep. in, in all of this work, Jerry, is, you know, we, we understand, you know, and it'll work that um, Mile High is doing and these, these folks are doing in other areas is really taking into account climate change as well to make sure that as we go forward, we're really incorporating native species that are going to allow us to sustain through periods like that. Yeah, what I'm thinking of is like the Eyeline Canal, for instance, mm -hmm. where all those cottonwoods are dying because they don't have yep. water. Yeah, we have, well, this is we have another spot in the park further south um, that's just um, you know just that south uh, west of Mineral and Santa Fe where we have an augmentation plan in one Centennial Water and Sand District because we have the same issue in the forest down there as use has changed over time as climate has changed um, how do we continue to keep a viable um, tree canopy in there for a variety of reasons and this is this is in that same thought pattern. So, so along those lines, uh, what we want to do is, is this area here highlighted in yellow is we want to lower it three to four feet. So it is pretty much at the same level as this uh, um, high quality vegetation that you see kind of growing along the river, along that riparian terrace. And the intent of doing that is that they both can be kind of hydrologically connected. And, uh, and by doing that, eventually we, that would allow the expansion of that high quality vegetation into this, into this area. So we think that there is a, basically a unique opportunity that we have to do in this project is that there are minimal to no opportunities of doing something like this throughout and it becomes the a Denver filter. metro area along the Sapla River. And it becomes a filter as well. Essentially, and, yeah. And, and it, and it will definitely ex expand, yeah. expand some of that habitat by connecting the river floodplain to that open space. Is this space like area. Congress Park? Um, a similar kind of concept and you know one of our one of the big changes in you know flood control and stormwater management over the last few decades really is a movement to much more um, green outfalls you know we're going to use nature we're going to use the wildlife we're going to use the ground we're going to use vegetation to be able to do that filtering prior to entering a major waterway as opposed to the old days when there'd be just drop structures and then we're in there cleaning out sediment over and over and over again. So it's a much more naturalized and green approach to attacking stormwater and flood control at the same time. So that could be flooded if under certain mm -hmm. conditions. Yep. Yes. It's designed to be flooded right. and then exactly. still be there when the flood proceeds. And right. you can still use it as part. Right. Got it. And floods are going to be rare, but we have to plan for them. One thing I would add is uh, when new development happens, they're, requ they're required to treat their runoff to uh, prevent pollution from a stormwater standpoint, but this outfall comes from an older part of town that would have been developed before those sorts of water quality standards would have been in place. And so this little section of yellow that'll be green and maybe I'll show you what we think it could look like, takes on an outsized value because it's the only place some of that water probably gets cleaned from a, a pollutant standpoint before it reaches the river, uh, the resource that we're 
generally trying to protect. And also, just to kind of reiterate some of what Meg Deal said, uh, the outfall will probably have some trickle of flow coming out of it, because typically when people water their lawns, some of it gets on the street, that flows down the curb and gutter, ends up in the storm drain, ends up coming out here. So it, it'll probably have a little bit of water on a daily basis, but a lot of what the vegetation will rely on will be that groundwater connectivity Correct. to the nearby water in the south pond. Should be connected to the water table there. Yeah, right. yeah, exactly. So the, this here is some kind of present photos, images that um, that we kind of, you know, uh, envision that area to look, uh, you know, kind of created some of that low flow channel. Here's where that culvert is coming in. And then here's the open space area where we're kind of thinking about that low flow channel we'll go through before it goes into the, the South Platte River. And uh, this is kind of the environment and ecosystem that we would like that area to to support. Um, and again, you know, wetland and riparian vegetation growth are the benefits, increased river habitat, water quality, and river connectivity. Um, another photo that kind of shows some of that wetland habitat that, um, you know, we would like that area to kind of support, filter that, some of that water. I'm going to turn it over to David Scudas. We'll, we'll continue talking to you about facing scheduling. All right, fingers crossed. We'll see. <laughs> waiting. Yeah. You're waiting. Oh, oh, it worked. All right. Uh, back to the site Sorry, plan. Bill. <laughs> back to the site plan that, that Bill showed you earlier. On this on this next one, uh, oh, well, let's see. I shouldn't have said anything. Uh, it's got, you can see this red outline. So you, you may or may not recall that there would have been, a, what, a year and a half or two years ago, perhaps, they would have seen it. You, you might have seen a, uh, an older version of this site plan that was much more scaled back. Uh, and, and you can see just from this how much more the, the, the vision and, and area of the project is really expanded. And so we, at this point, really see a, a phasing, you know, this isn't set in stone by any means, but our initial look at phasing would group the project in these various ways. The, the green project would be the base project, as we're calling it, which would be uh, the river, the Mary Carter Greenway Trail, some of the interior trails, and include the expansion of that south parking lot. Uh, then the pink would be the Upland Park phase. Uh, you've got the, the flood terrace that Meg Yale was just describing there in Cyan, uh, the buildings in purple, and then a, a modification to that north parking lot to uh, in, increase the number of parking spots. Uh, a couple things I'll point out about the costs. Uh, they, they do include design and construction. It's all in. Uh, you'll notice on all but the all but the green. You'll know you'll know that there's a range of costs, and that's because those phases are a little bit further out. Gives them a little bit less certainty about how much we think they'll cost with inflation going haywire and, and things like that. Uh, all of the costs you see at this point include a healthy 20% contingency that, that we're including there to date. Uh, the green project we didn't show a range, and that's because we have the design further along. And our contractor, Nerano Civil, has even taken an early cut at pricing based on a very preliminary set of plans. And so we have a little bit better idea of what about that should cost. Uh, let's see, what else was I going to say about that? Uh, the green phase is by far the most complicated and most expensive to build and includes a lot of environmental permitting that we need to go through, which we're hoping to initiate here in the next couple of months to, to submit for those permits. It's also the phase where we're going to have a lot of yellow iron out there. There's going to be a lot of dirt moving. And it's a great opportunity to really set the topography for much, if not all, of the site all at once. Because we have to go through floodplain permitting. And floodplain permitting, your, your topography affects that. And so any place we're going to place fill, it would be advantageous to do with that initial green phase. Potentially set the topography for the entire site, after which it becomes really efficient to add parking add park elements, add other things, and there's not a lot of dirt you need to move. The topography's already set as a foundational element. Uh, one nice thing about the funding for the base project phase is, you know, we're going to start off with a, a fair amount of contingency, but if any of that contingency goes unused, the other phases are a lot easier to permit and implement than the river work. And so there's, there's a lot of opportunity to build more as we get through that phase, and how, depending on how the costs come in. Uh, as far as the funding outlook right now, uh, the funds we have in hand that are available for the project, you can see there in green and, and who the, the funding partners have been. With the, then these are the funds that we're holding at the flood district. 
uh, officially budgeted funds. You can see there in the next column with contributions from the flood district in Littleton. So that's just budget budget that somebody has officially on some sort of approved budget. Uh, additional requested funds that we feel good about, we got a nice feeling about, but we have we don't have firm 100% commitments yet. You can see there in gray, and it adds up to this this column here on the right, and you can see. Uh, uh, on that green phase, it added up to 19.2 million, which I didn't point out. And you'll notice that's a little bit short of that. And that's where we, because of how early we are in design still, we're hopeful that in the next six to 12 months as the design matures, that perhaps the cost of the base project will come down and fit within our contingency, but that will just have to play itself out as we see material prices fluctuate over the next six to 12 months. And as the design matures and we have real details around exactly what the contractor is going to build, just as a simple example, the, that bridge that Bill showed, we don't have a structural design on that, that yet. We don't know if the foundation needs to be 10 feet deep or 20 feet deep. That's just, just one example of how that needs to flesh, flesh itself out. Uh, we hope to go to construction on this phase starting in the winter of 2023, so about a year and a half from now. This type of thing, the river work needs to be done in the low flow season when the river's down. Uh, so those funding years are between now and 2024. Uh, the pink phase, uh, the Upland Park. Oh, come on thing. I pushed the button. There you go. Uh, that, that's in pink there. You can see uh, funds that Littleton has budgeted and then funds that we are hopeful for from some of the other entities involved. We are showing a budget that's at the high end of that cost range that I showed on the earlier slide. And that uh, assumes funding years of 2024 to 2025. And I don't know, Keith, if you want to talk about your aspirations for funding that earlier. So, um, you know, what I, from my perspective, when we, when we work as a project team with all of our partners, you know, one of the things that, you know, I've, talk to the team about it. So I think that if we um, if we really work aggressively with our partners and we continue to seek outside funding, I would really like to see us be able to combine phase one and phase two to deliver those simultaneously if the funding becomes available. And I think if we set you know a stretch goal as an organ as an organization and as a group to do that, I think we can do that. And that's what I'd like to to work towards. Um, the numbers that you see in the light green are showing currently in our open space capital plan. Um, the previous slide you saw, that's already in the open space capital plan. This 1.5 is already set aside related to Superchi in the open space capital plan. Um, and so I think as we continue to play this out as the design, I had, as I was sharing with these three earlier, I had a great meeting this morning with GOCO. Um, talking specifically about this project and over the last two years during COVID, GOCO has changed their funding formulas and they've created a new category which is really about community enhancement and this project really fits tremendously into that new category. Um, so we're going to be talking with them more. Um, we have had, we already have discussions with one nonprofit in town. I recently met with um, Breckenridge Brewery and Anheuser Busch. Um, related to this project. Um, Bill, all these guys were part of that meeting. Um, it was really kind of disappointing because we had it on a Tuesday and it was late in the afternoon and I had to come and meet with you all after. So I couldn't yeah. indulge prior to coming to meet with you. You know, that was the biggest downside of the meeting for me personally. But, um, you know, so we're continuing all of that relationship work. And, and I would really, I think it's an aspirational goal for us to try and do phase one and phase two together. I presume um, there's efficiencies. Yeah, absolutely. There's efficiencies in that. So part of this in, in what I want you to kind of think about here sort of from a design and construction perspective is, you know, one of the, to compare this to the, the wastewater treatment plant, we've been using more what we would call progressive design build. So we go through part of design. At that point in time, we see where we are, we see what the value engineering is, and we make more decisions going forward from that point. And that's really what we're doing with this project when it comes to funding, when it comes to design. Having the contractor on board at this point allows us to do that. So we have future decision points that'll 
give us the opportunity to accelerate or change course if we need to. Um, you know, hopefully Mother Nature is not going to come in there and move the topography for us between now and 2023, but I have lived through that um, in my career, so one never knows. So And that happened last time we did a major river work. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Yeah, I mean, so, it was over a million dollars lost work. Well, this is true, but it just moved it downstream for us. So, you know, you got to look at it that way. Mother Nature's moving your dirt for you somehow. But our liner was torn up. Right, exactly. Yeah. So, Combining phase one and phase two, would that be contingent on these additional funds? Um, yeah, the additional, the stuff that you see in green is, is in, that's showing in our plans right now. And so that additional funding request is really dependent upon continuing to work with our partners. South Suburban, with uh, Arapahoe County Open Space, with with GOCO, with other agencies to see where we can get to. How optimistic are you uh, in terms of getting additional funds from South Suburban and Arapahoe County? You talked about GOCO. Um, we had, we've continued, uh, I, feel, I feel better about South Suburban at this point, but we still have a lot of work to do. Um, and that Arapahoe County, in fact, we just had a discussion that on the 27th, we're presenting to their open space board um, really related to this. They're going to see kind of the same thing um, in their commitment. And we just were rushing to get some paperwork in this week or into last week. So, um, you know, I, it's I, what I can tell you is, is that amongst all of our partners, there's a great deal of momentum right now. And I think people see, you know, we're at a point now where people can really wrap their heads around the vision of the project. And, and this is a great opportunity for us to really continue to collaborate and, and bring it together to make it happen. I think South Suburban, you know, needs to be a major partner in that. I mean, that's what, you know, one of the board members talks about how much, you know, the Mary Carter Greenway, you know, plays into that their plan. You know, they're and, like a minor partner on this, and that's one of their, their jewels there. They need... You hear that South Suburban? You need to become a better partner. That's correct. And, and so... to. To, to go to that little sliver of purple um, that's in there. You know, what's really showing in the little yeah. sliver of purple on the map is, you know, South Suburb, one of the things we learned since we took over the Superchi property, yeah, yeah, that's a better picture. One of the things we learned since we took over the Superchi property is um, we allowed South Suburban to place some equipment there, and it really did help in their maintenance operations. Um, so we originally had some discussions about you know, having what we saw as a small building that would have maintenance stuff. Well, all of a sudden it turned into uh, the major facility for all their rangers. Which, oh, like an office. An office that was a surprise to us. And I said, well, have we had a discussion about do we need to do something at Carson first? Um, at Carson Nature Center. So that's an evolutionary process. And I've said, as the city staff member involved in this, I've been pretty clear that if, if if South Suburban wants a ranger building in there, then th that's not in there right now. There needs to be a boatload of funding, no pun intended, coming down the river for from them to get that ranger situation in there. So that's something that will work through as we go through the process going forward. Is the house Littleton's? The, the that property is all Mary, Littleton's. Mary Carter House. It's a house. Suburban. It's a it's a house. No, I'm not talking about the Perchie House. I'm talking about... The, the Nature Center. Carson Nature Center? Yeah. Yes, Carson Nature Center is ours. And ironically, for those of you who don't know, this came up, I just learned this in the last couple of weeks as part of our digitization project. Um, one of the files that showed up on my desk to review had pictures in it of when they moved the Carson Nature Center there. It was previously on a property that was further up mineral and it was donated to the city and it was moved to the location that it exists today. It was a residential, it was a residential log cabin on a farm. And in the pictures, it's really interesting because it's loaded on a tractor trailer, moving it down mineral, and mineral is dirt. <laughs> it's gravel, and there's nothing in the background. There's not a single thing on the hillsides behind it. You used to go hunting there. You know, and I had no idea that that was the case until this came up in my file this week. So I learned a little bit about Carson Nature Center in the past couple of weeks. So How about you know, Anheuser Bush? How did that meeting go? Uh, I had that meeting with them, and um, you know, Bill and Meg Neal were in that meeting, and it was we had a very good meeting with them. They've, we've kept them informed. Um, throughout this project, um, uh, you know, right before COVID, um, we had folks from their corporate office out here to walk the site with us um, from their corporate offices. Uh, and so they're, 
they're definitely involved. They see this as a huge benefit, and we're going to continue to work through that discussion with them. I noticed with the partners that Columbine Valley wasn't there. I mean, it, 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 it borders Columbine Valley. I'm not thinking that they have a ton of funds, but you know, why are they not part of the... Well, we're, that's part of what we have to work on from here. And that's a part where we see also you know, your role as council members in, in bringing some of those outside partners to the table as well, having a discussion with them and saying, hey, this is a big project. We'd like to see you be part of that. So Crumbin beyond here. the staff level, I, you know, that's at your level as well to continue to, to build that. Well, we, we need to hear that more than two. <laughs> Keep these uh, future budgeted funds for the city of Littleton, the 2700 Are those already in the budget? And then there's a 2700 And 1500 15, Yeah, are those already? 1.5. Yeah, the $2.7 and 1.5 are already budgeted. Those, those are in our capital our open space capital plan at this point in time already. Another thing that came up, if you remember when we were talking about this a long time ago, like whenever we came before, about parking and the parking kind of limits the number of people that will utilize this park and what is the optimum amount and then what do you do if there's overflow? Have you kind of... At, Bill can probably speak to that better than anyone, but we've that's been a big discussion point for us as a design team throughout, uh -huh. um, especially with South Suburban, because we feel that that's, that's critically important. Um, and, and so all the designs have incorporated supplemental parking. And where would that be? Where it is it's, now. It's there, so there's almost 250 spots, roughly. Yeah, Bill can show you here. So this is would be like part of the phase one. Uh, and that would add about another 60 plus uh, cars. And does that right size the number of people it's, that can participate? I mean, do we want it overflowing with people or is the parking limited? I mean, how do you kind of balance that? There was a park, uh, Merrick had done a, a parking study with some of the data from, from South Suburban. And, and you hit peaks on some of the weekends right. during the summer months. Uh, but... We think that we're going to have, you know, typically people are, are parking there and riding, riding bikes or running in the morning when it's cool, and the river users are in the afternoon when it's warmer. Ah, I see. So we hope that there's not as much overlap and that, you know, the early morning walkers have gone home and then the river users can show up. So we've expanded sense. the parking by 60 in phase one, and we have the ability to add another. Uh, 70 spaces if needed. We just want to make sure the greenway is pushed out far enough so for future, you know, if it, if the use becomes that great. How about Breckenridge Overflow using that spot? Is it used much now? Uh, Bre Breckenridge or yeah. Breckenridge using the? Well, Breckenridge yes. customers. They they yes, do they, yeah, they yeah. do use some of the park the parking so that's kind of a management type of thing. You know, at some of those peak peak overlap times when we might have heavy weekend use. They're also, we're working, they've come to us with some other concepts for more stuff on their property um, from a development perspective. So we're we're working through that with them too. So actually, ironically, one of the biggest challenges is when their trucks, when trucks miss the entrance, tractor trailers. No. Oh. Turn around. It's yes. not the easiest place to turn a truck around. <laughs> Just so you know, um, Chatfield, you know, those gravel ponds, that parking, and those are our boat users, locks up about 9.30 in the morning. And if you don't get there by 9.30, you don't get a place until way in the afternoon for some of the smaller gravel ponds. So I'm wondering if people will say, well, if I come to the river after 10, and then you've got the walkers and the riders and the I, I, river users. Different uses, all though. Competing. People go on the boat, they get out there for the full day. That's, yeah, I don't think. But, you know, but my point is, you have to get there earlier and earlier to get a, to get a spot. Right, but it's different uses, so I don't. I, it's kind of, I don't know if that's a great comparison. I, I think that, no, but, it, but the parking lot fills up. Is my point. Yeah. It doesn't stop being full all day. Yeah. Right. right. There's not a changeover in users. I think one of the things too that we're talking about um, more with South Suburban um, over the last couple of years is um, how do we continue to provide. Enhance the access points of the Mary Carter. Um, you know uh, how do we how do we continue? You know, for example, how do we how do we improve the parking on the west side of the river? For example, where you you know wander in through there that's on core property um, right now. Um, and how do you you know how do we continue to 
enhance the relationship with RTD to provide more access at Carson um, and other locations along the parkway. And I, I think that's also part of our messaging and signage um, as we move forward so that we can continue to, you know, spread people out on the corridor to get them access. Because I think that's that's a spot where we're not as good as we could be at this point in time. So that's something that we're, we're talking with them about. Okay. Let's go forward. Continue. Ready? Oh, let's see if I have a few more slides I have. I don't know if I uh, Yeah, um, let's see. Uh, next steps, uh, can continue design work, hoping to submit for permits uh, here this fall. That's, we have to get permissions from the Corps of Engineers to get in and do the work in the river, and that could take a good year to get permission from them for that. Uh, we're going to keep working on budgeting with our contractor, uh, we, we did present last week to the South Suburban uh, Board. Uh, we're going to Arapahoe County on the 27th. Uh, public outreach is going to continue. We're, we're planning on a pop-up event uh, late summer, or early fall. And then uh, look for final site plan approval from South Suburban and Littleton so that we can start turning dirt. Great. Thumbs up. I, yeah, it looks, I like it. looks good. Well, uh, and we, we want you guys, as we get into this public outreach phase, we'll pass it along to you so you can continue to share that with the community, get more feedback. Um, we have, um, from a staff perspective, we had, right before COVID, we had Congressman Crow out on site to do a walkthrough to take a look at it to, you know, kind of build some more opportunities, just continue to grow how we might get funding into this project, so. Does staff approve the final site plan or do we? Well, yes. Both? Huh? Who approves the final site plan? Staff or you do. council? Council does. Council does. So I was asking if you thought we were okay with it. Yes. Oh, no, no. <laughs> we're I okay thought, with it. I right thought, yes. yes, we're okay with the design at this point in time. Yes, we are. Both of, okay. so. <clears throat> and then the Mile High Flood District Board would have to approve as well at some point. Uh, our share of the funding. Yep. Yeah. We'll see it Looks good. This is going to be a truly iconic project for the community, so we're excited mm -hmm. uh, to keep moving this thing forward. So Great. thanks to all our partners. We wouldn't be here without the Thank tremendous you. collaboration and partnership right. and leadership for Mile High, especially yep. in this process. Great. So. Okay. I think we got the feedback we need. Sounds yeah. like Thank it. you. All right. Great. Any reporter update? <laughs> just wanted to be here. <laughs> <laughs> if, uh, if anybody needs mulch, if you haven't picked your mulch up, please uh, please I, I, did get one, so. I took five trailer loads of branches over there, and I took one trailer load of mulch back. That's, that's called that's called compression of yes. mass, yeah. right? You know, so every day we have to go. Just so you know, we're not apparently back in '95 when they did this. Uh, they built Thank a big you. pile, and then Thank you. you know, we I'm a trash Thanks, guy, guys. so I know that you got to turn Thank the pile. You. In 1995, they failed to know that, and the pile oh, went on no. fire um, when this happened in the past. So every morning, we have a, a loader that drives over there and turns the pile so that we don't have that. So, yeah. Yeah. so they're doing a great job. Do you have an update? Yeah. Yep, I sure do. Uh, two updates. One, uh, Littleton City Center is going to be without water tomorrow. So uh, for the Rio Grande Bridge replacement. So those folks wanting city services tomorrow probably should call ahead and see if they're open because a lot of places are just going to be not allowing walk-ins. And Monday is Juneteenth. Well, it's June 20th, but the city will be celebrating Juneteenth. And so Library Museum... Uh, city center service center will be closed. Oh, good to know. So, yeah. Yeah. Great. That's it. Thanks. The restrooms will be available. We're adjourned. Right. Good.